As always, it's a great pleasure to be before you. If you would be turning over to the book of Revelation, I would like to continue and finish our study on the book of Revelation as we started last month. One thing we do need to keep in mind about the book of Revelation is the fact that it is employing symbols, figurative language. And there are many things found in this book that might not make sense to us, but it's because it's written in such a way to mean something to people in a particular predicament by and using these symbols. So words use different meanings because of that instance. Cannot be taken literally as we would take other passages of scripture literally. I would like to continue our study, as I said, on the Beatitudes found in the book of Revelation. As we mentioned last time, the, the word Beatitude is not actually found in the New Testament. However, it describes a biblical concept, a beautiful attitude, a good attitude that Christians must possess. When we think of Beatitudes, I think we most often go to Matthew chapter 5. For there's a long list of Beatitudes. We can't just have one of those attitudes and say we're faithful. We've got to possess all of those Beatitudes. That's not to say it's going to be easy. It will take work. Being a Christian takes work. It takes dedication. It takes discipline. And the Beatitudes that we've been studying in the book of Revelation are no exception to that. Now we also introduced a different word, which is blessed last time. Blessed. And the late brother Guy in Woods, I think, gives a very pretty picture of this term, blessed. Taken from his commentary on the book of James, he has this to say about the Greek word makarios, which translated for the King James Version, is blessed. His quote is as follows. The word makarios, translated blessed in the text, describes one who is in a state of blessing, sometimes declared to be a happy one. However, our English word happy is an inadequate term to denote the state of blessedness which the original word describes. Blessedness is a condition resulting from a state of inner peace, whereas happiness is dependent on external circumstances. The former is in the heart and not subject to interference from or the whims of others. The latter involves matters over which one cannot always maintain control. Happiness is more often produced by material affairs. Blessedness is much more spiritual and therefore of a far more enduring quality. Happiness, closely, closely related to the world, cannot always be enjoyed. Blessedness, which is not dependent on material matters, may ever be the cherished possession of the faithful, however poor they may be in this world's goods. Blessedness is a characteristic of God himself. We find this in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. Thus, the more we become like God, the more blessed we are. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Now this term blessed, the Greek word makarios, appears seven times within the book of Revelation. Last time, we discussed three of these appearances. This morning, I would like for us to discuss the remaining four. Now, the book of Revelation was written to warn of coming events at the time. However, these principles found in the book of Revelation can be gleaned for us to benefit from. After all, these things were shown to the servants of Christ at the time, and because of that, the principles we can gain from it will be beneficial for Christians for all time. Our fourth beatitude is found in Revelation chapter 19, verse 9. 
I would like to read verses 6 through 9, though, to get a better picture. Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 through 9. It says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigneth. Let us rejoice and be exceeding glad. Let us give the glory unto him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And it was given unto her that she should array herself in fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they that are bidden to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true words of God. So our first beatitude of the day. Fourth in the book of Revelation. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Happy or supremely blessed are those who are called to this wedding supper. Such a supper indicates the joys that will be found in heaven for those who are faithful. Feasts, weddings, or otherwise here on earth will end. You think of all the different banquets that we have. Even yesterday, our potluck at Fish Hatchery, if you were able to be there yesterday, we had, as always, a great dinner with them. But no matter how great the feast it was, it still ended. Things like this, we are accustomed to that ending. Nothing gold can stay. However, the joys of heaven will never end. Truly, those who are bidden to this feast are happy or blessed. Just whom is this wedding feast prepared or prepared for? Verse 7 says that the lamb and his wife are set to be married. Well, the lamb is Jesus, the sacrificial lamb of God. And the wife here in this verse is talking about the church. Paul points to the church being the bride of Christ in Romans chapter 7, verse 4. It says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. He's pointing out the fact that Jesus did away with the old law, and as a result of that, the Jews were scripturally... Uh, or had the right to remarry another because they were married to the law of Moses. They understood this concept when it came down to the marriage bond and he's making application between the testaments. Jesus put aside the law of Moses. Thus, as a governing body of authority, the law of Christ could then be married to. Those who were obedient to the law of Moses were subject to it as a wife to her husband. The death of Christ fulfilled the law of Moses, and thus its authority ceased. Christians then are figuratively wedded to Christ. This is further discussed in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 32. In that passage, he's drawing a parallel between the husband and wife relationship. And he draws the conclusion that, in verse 31 and 32, says, For this cause... Shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh? This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. You see, the marriage bond was always meant to point to the church, the relationship to the Christian and Jesus, the relationship to the body of the saved and to Jesus. We find this concept also found in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. Now, because each individual Christian has this special relationship to Jesus, the church, which is the collective body of the saved, also has that relationship to Jesus. We find in Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14, the parable of the wedding feast. You find in this passage that many were called to this feast, yet only a few were actually chosen. The focus 
was to have each guest possess certain righteous characteristic, or character rather. Those who did not possess this righteous character were not bid into the, wed the wedding feast. Now, Jesus uses the attire of these guests to represent their character. And as it turned out, the people of his day had issues dressing up for the occasion, just like we do sometimes. Many of them were not properly prepared. They were not properly dressed for the occasion. And because of that, they were disqualified for attending the wedding feast. How often is this true of us when we gather for worship and we're not dressed formally? We're not putting on our best. We're not exhibiting our godly characteristics, if indeed we possess them. A similar picture is also painted in Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. The parable of the ten virgins. Here, members of the wedding party were to await the arrival of the bridegroom. They did not know when he was going to come, but they had to be ready for it to come to pass. They were expected to be fully prepared for his arrival. And since they had no idea when this would take place, they needed adequate supplies so that they would be ready for the journey when it began. We see this in their, their storage of the oil for their lamps. They had enough to light their lamps while they're waiting, but also enough oil to light their lamps as they journeyed. Those who were prepared, they were permitted to enter into the wedding hall to partake in that feast. Now what qualifies these people to be invited to the wedding supper? The answer is found in Revelation chapter 19, verse 8. And it was given unto her, the church, that she should array herself in fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So the righteous acts of saints are, equa are equated to fine linen. Saints are those who have obeyed the gospel and remained faithful to it. They're the people who have heard the gospel's call. They've believed. They've repented of their sins. They've confessed Christ before others. And they've been baptized for the remission of their sins. At that point, they're a Christian. And they're saints. You don't have to be voted upon. You don't have to be dead for 300 years and perform a miracle. At the point that you are saved, your sins have been blotted out, you become a saint. And as I said, they had to remain faithful. Part of this is doing righteous acts. And even though they stumble, just as we stumble, the blood of Christ continues to cleanse. 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, and 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Living faithfully to God includes performing righteous deeds, righteous acts. Galatians 6, 10, do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. And they are to obviously abstain from wickedness. James chapter 1 verse 27 and James chapter 2 verse 18. So they're so, supposed to abstain from wickedness, but to do works of righteousness. Those who die faithful to God are eventually granted heaven. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. Collectively, these saints form the bride of Christ. And because of their righteous deeds, the bride of Christ is then adorned in pure, bright, fine, beautiful linen. You think of brides that we, we see at weddings. They have these long flowing dresses, and they're pretty. Most of the time they sparkle because of the different bedazzling or the whatever kinds of gems that they, they have sewn on. It's a pretty sight to see. And you think of the, the groom as he's waiting on her to walk down the aisle, how nervous he, he might be. He's probably shaking. He's probably smiling. Never before has he seen her like that. That's a similar picture of Jesus and the church. His church needs to be pure. His church is made pure by being faithful to the will of God that's been set forth for her to follow. We as individual members, we as Christians make the church beautiful by our righteous acts. 
which is why it's such a big deal, such a concern when we do sin, especially in a public manner when we bring reproach on the church. It's also partly why that when we do sin, it's talked about as our garments being stained. Now our second beatitude of the morning, beatitude number five. Revelation chapter 20 verse 6. It says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So the beatitude, the blessed attitude. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Now this is a class of people who are supremely blessed, and they're sacred, they're holy. Now this part, he who hath part in this resurrection, the part, that term there is, it refers to an allotment, a section of something. If you buy a piece of land, you've purchased that plot of land. You have part in that property. If it's a family, maybe you pooled your money and you own a portion of that property, you have part of that property. Blessed and holy is he that has that part, that allotment in the first resurrection. It's similar to a shareholder of a company. You own a portion of that company until you sell that share or that um, stock. Thus, it can be forfeited if the terms are not complied with. It is indeed possible for a Christian to fall from grace. Galatians chapter 5 verse 4. We can lose our soul's salvation by turning away from the gospel of Christ. What is this first resurrection though? Keeping in mind that the book of Revelation uses symbolic, uh, symbolic language, figures. The first resurrection must be either literal or figurative. If this is a literal resurrection, there must then be three total resurrections. If there's a first and it's dedicated to those who are faithful, those who have uh, on such the second death will have no power, there must be another resurrection on those which the second death does have power over. That would be the second resurrection. The third resurrection would be the resurrection of all other souls on the day of judgment. A literal resurrection is thus in direct contradiction to other passages, such as Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 13. It says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from, though, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things, which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell, or Hades, delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. This would be depicting the final judgment. John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29 says, Marvel not at this, this is Jesus speaking, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. These passages point to one singular event with two possible outcomes. And those outcomes are determined based upon how those souls lived upon the earth. Heaven or hell being their final result, their final reward. Thus this first resurrection cannot be taken as a literal resurrection. It must then be a figurative resurrection. Can you think of any type of resurrection that we undergo? 
Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 9 points to such. The inspired Paul says, Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into the Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. Our old way of living, our old manner of conduct is put to death when we go below that water, when we're buried in those waters of baptism. When we rise up out of the water, we are figuratively resurrected. Baptism allows one to take part in the first resurrection. Remaining faithful maintains that status of blessedness. Now, for those on which the second death hath no power, that phrase. This is only true of the person which we just described. They have undergone the first resurrection, baptism for the remission of sins, and they dedicate their lives to God by following His will for man. All others, we know, will be punished. Revelation chapter 20, verses 14 and 15. It says there that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That would be Gehenna hell, the final abode of the wicked. All who choose to disobey God will be cast into this lake of fire. One thing to note about that lake of fire, its existence is to punish Satan. It was prepared for Satan and his followers, his angels. We, if we're unfaithful to God, will be getting the same type of punishment that Satan will be receiving. If that's something that is appealing to you, by all means, continue living as you are unfaithful to God. However, this cannot be said, this is not the case with the faithful. The second death, or Gehenna hell, as it is in the Greek, has no power over those who are faithful. It has no authority over them. It has no jurisdiction over the saints. Now this status is finalized when one physically dies. Revelation chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. To the church at Smyrna, it is written, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. So it's not enough just to take part in the first resurrection, although that is a big step. You must overcome. You must be faithful unto death. When the faithful die, they cannot be harmed by Gehenna hell. Instead, we see that they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. This class of people are all of those who were faithful to God in this life. Because of that, they are free from the second death. Instead, they will be serving God in heaven for the rest of eternity. Instead, as we are servants here, we'll be reigning with Christ. We'll be priests and kings. 
This falls in line with passages such as Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, which reads, And from Christ Jesus, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Also in First Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, that passage reads, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. The idea here is that the church, the body of the saved, is a kingdom of priests. We serve in this capacity to some extent on earth, but in heaven, that capacity will be expanded. We'll be worshiping God in His very presence. Our next beatitude, Revelation chapter 22, verse 7. I would also like to read verse 6. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. We find that these words are faithful and true. They're trustworthy. As it were, we can take them to the bank. We can depend on them. This is a commentary regarding the validity of Old Testament prophecy. Just as they were guided by God in the, in the days of old, John too was now guided to record this message. Such uh, guidance brought about the recordings found in the Bible. Not just in the book of Revelation, but also including what we consider the major minor prophets. When they were doing their work, God was guiding them. Israel of old was expected to heed those prophetic warnings, those prophetic teachings. However, generally speaking, we know that they did not. And due to their unwillingness to follow those warnings, they were punished. They were carried off into captivity. They were plagued by multiple warrings and uprisings. And it can be rightly stated that Israel would have been blessed for keeping the sayings of the prophets. Unfortunately, many of them were purged because of their unfaithfulness. Now the same message is being given to the brethren of the first century. Be faithful to the sayings of this book, this prophecy, specifically the book of Revelation, to them. If they heeded the warnings found in this book, they would be considered blessed. If they chose to ignore them, they would be found unfaithful. And they would be following in the steps of Israel of old. And thus deserving of the punishment that would follow. We might not fully understand the meanings of various passages in the book of Revelation. But the brethren of the time to whom they were given would have understood their meaning. And we must never discount that fact. The warnings that they were given would have helped them survive possibly physical death. But it also helped them to bear up under the persecution that they were facing at the time. It would help each and every one of them to grow their faith in God and even their hope in God. Now we will not benefit exactly as they did from the book of Revelation. However, we certainly can benefit from the principles contained therein. Each of these principles are useful for all Christians. Now the beatitude itself. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. It's pretty plain teaching. If you follow God's book, you'll be in a state of blessedness. This attitude was seen in a prayer given by Nehemiah to God 
in Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. It says, And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept, and mourned certain days, and fasted, and prayed before God, or the God of heaven, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him, and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive, and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou hast commanded thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commanded thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me, and keep my commandments, and do them, Though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence, and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these, now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by the great power and by thy strong hand. This was prayed under the law of Moses, but Nehemiah is exhibiting a righteous attitude. How much better off would all members of the church be if we possessed a similar attitude as this? Crying for God's mercy, saying we're going to be faithful, and then following through and being faithful to God. Our seventh beatitude is found in Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. Verse 12 says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers, and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So blessed are they that do his commandments. The American Standard Version 1901 actually renders that as blessed are they that wash their robes. Either way, faithfulness is depicted. One cannot be obedient to God without washing their robes in the blood of Christ. One cannot wash their robes in the blood of Christ without obeying the commandment to be baptized. Although I am kind of partial to the washing of their robes because I think it's much more of a pretty picture given the figurative language used. But they're synonyms. They depict the same message. By doing so, one then becomes eligible to gain access to to heaven, and thereby the tree of life. We see in the book of Genesis, after the sin in the garden with Adam and Eve, they were cast out, the lifespan of, of people after that began to decline. As man got further away from the tree of life, his years also decreased. Now, sure, we can uh, advance technology and medicine and extend our lives a few more years but ultimately we too will die physically but those who will be granted the reward of heaven will have access again to the tree of life and because of that they will never again be separated from the true source of immortality and because of that only those in heaven or those who are inhabiting heaven 
are pure. He uses the phrase, for without, outside of this place, heaven, there are dogs. We're not talking about Rover, Fido, and whatever other name you might have for your puppy. These are those who are unclean spiritually. It's been said before that these are morally bankrupt people. Only those who have had their robes washed will gain access to heaven. Those who have not will be kept out. All those who have chosen to remain spiritually unclean, they receive the label of dogs and are members of the following list of sins at that time, as we just read. We can choose to remain sinners by spurning the gospel. Our Corinthian brethren chose better. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Know ye not that righteousness, or unrighteousness rather, shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with men, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye were washed, but ye were sanctified, but ye were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. So they could have chosen to remain in that group of people. Thieves, drunkards, those who are covetous. But instead they chose, as it were, to wash their robes in the blood of Christ. While we remain on this earth, the choice is ours to make. To be faithful to God or to be faithful to Satan. However, when we die, our time for choosing ends at that point. After this, the judgment comes. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. At this point, we will all have to give an account of all of our actions. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10. And from that point, we go on to accept our reward based on how we live here, either heaven or hell. Now this will complete our study of the Beatitudes of the book of Revelation. These are just a few things which we can learn from these Beatitudes found in this great book of prophecy and figurative language, just as those brethren of old could have learned from, even throughout the centuries. We can learn to be blessed, happy, or fortunate by following the warnings, by following the admonishments contained herein and ultimately adhering to the message delivered. And by doing so, we also can expect to receive the same reward our faithful brethren received at the end of their life. These qualities are given to those who love the Lord and give up their lives in the Lord. We have discussed what it takes for this to happen. Ultimately, one must obey the gospel. From there, they must remain faithful to God in all that they do with all of their very being. Yet, when we do stumble and sin, which does happen from time to time, we must be quick to repent, or repent and ask for our forgiveness. We know that God is faithful and just, and He will forgive us when we do come to term with Him. We simply do not know when this world this physical world will end, and because of that, we must always be prepared. If you're prepared today, and you're prepared tomorrow, you're prepared every day, you're ready for His coming. Being prepared brings about our own happiness and peace in this life. The closest thing we will ever have to peace in this life is our peace with God. The war in Ukraine, no matter how terrible it is, even when this one ends... If it ever ends, another war is coming. Might be a small war, might be a large war. But wars, as long as people are people, we're all going to hate each other to one extent or another. And that's a sad state of affairs. But we can be surrounded by tribulation, temptations, wars, and still possess inner peace with our Creator. And we do that by being faithful to Him, by the will He's been given us. 
So are you prepared to receive your final reward? It's either heaven or hell. Are you ready for that final day? If not, take the necessary steps to prepare for heaven, unless you are indeed content with receiving hell as your reward. Whichever your need might be, please make it known as together we stand and sing. <laughs>